All right, everyone, we're going to get this thing kicked off. I've been so excited. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our virtual book launch with Ben Montgomery. His new book just dropped. I bet he's got a copy to hold up right there. A Shot in the Moonlight. And uh, I had this thing downloaded and read it in a day and a half. It was so good. I couldn't stop reading and um, kept on turning those digital pages until I was finished. So thank you all for joining us tonight for virtual book launch hosted by your Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library. I'm Miranda Erickson, Reader's Librarian, and I'm joined by my colleague, Matt. He's going to wave there. And Matt will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any tech issues um, or any questions, pop those there and we will get to those. A couple of quick announcements before we jump in. That's what I've got here. Um, check your chat for a link to reserve a copy of A Shot in the Moonlight from our library on ebook, uh, downloadable audiobook or print book, or you can buy your own copy of the book from our indie bookstore, The Raven. Thank you to The Raven for setting up sales for us. And that will come with a signed book plate for you, um, signed by Ben himself. And also save the date for our next author event, Black Oscars with Dr. Frederick Gooding. That is February 9th at 7 p.m. We'll put a registration link in the chat as well. And it, it sounds fascinating. He analyzed decades of Oscar nominations and winners and wrote the book Black, Black Oscars from Mammy to Minnie, what the Academy Awards tell us about African-Americans. And he's going to discuss how film representations of Black Americans reflect historical trends and impact audiences off screen. And and we will leave better able to recognize racial patterns in the media we consume. So I'm excited about that one coming up as well. And with that, for our main event, our stars of the evening, we're joined by author and journalist Ben Montgomery, a Pulitzer finalist. That's the only brag I'm going to do right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to talk about his newest book. And we are joined by Anthony Denning Sr., who is the great grandson of George Denning. And I'm so excited to have him here. I know that we also have other members of the family in the audience tonight, um, which is lovely. Um, don't have to put yourselves on the spot, but hello to all of you. And so happy to be doing this event with you. Um, I know that Ben's Facebook Live launch that he had planned a couple days ago didn't quite work out. So this is the big launch, right? We're it. <laughs> Welcome, Ben and Anthony. Um, ben, could you please tell us a little bit about your book and how you connected up with Anthony? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Miranda and Matt and uh, to the uh, Topeka library system there. Um, we are, I think, so honored to, uh, to join you tonight. Um, and thank you for everyone who tuned in. It shows that you uh, care about history, you care about reading, you care about books, you care about the library, and these are all sort of foundational in my mind to um, supporting American democracy. Um, so I can't, I can't uh, thank you enough. Um, in 1897, 25 white men with uh, about half of them with pistols rode up on horseback to the home of a of a, a farmer named George Denning. Uh, Denning was asleep with his family inside of his house when these men approached. Um, they were there under the auspices of, um, uh, uh, you know, investigating some theft that allegedly had occurred in the little community where they lived near Price's Mill in southwestern Kentucky, in a place called Simpson County, Kentucky, and. Um, uh, depending on whose version of events you choose to believe, they uh, uh, shouted into the house for the man inside to come out. Um, George Denning refused to come outside. Uh, they made some threats. Um, at least one of them disguised himself with a handkerchief over his face. Um, uh, and uh, eventually they began to shoot into the house uh, when he refused to come outside. He grabbed his own shotgun um, by the way, this is five years after uh, the famed journalist Ida B. Wells wrote um, the following. Um, a Winchester rifle deserves a place of honor in every black home to protect ourselves when the law won't. Um, George Denning followed that pursuit. He picked up his own rifle. Uh, uh, ran upstairs in the process of running upstairs. He got shot in the arm through a window. 
uh, when he finally made it upstairs, he threw open the shutters, uh, leaned out, pointed his gun, squeezed off one shot. At the same time, he squeezed off this shot. He took a bullet in his own head. It, it grazed his scalp, didn't kill him, uh, but, but left a wound on his head. He squeezed off one shot and he struck and killed the 32-year-old scion of the wealthiest farm family in southwestern Kentucky, a man named Jody Kahn. And this, uh, this shooting set in motion a series of events which to this day remains remarkable and is the entire reason that I decided to write this book. Um, Denning turned himself in the following morning to the sheriff. Um, the sheriff at a time when um, lynchings were a regular thing, the sheriff protected Denning, moved him to Bowling Green and then on to Louisville. Denning eventually was brought to trial he was convicted of manslaughter by a jury made up of all white men. And he was sentenced to seven years in prison. Um, the governor of Kentucky at the time, Bill Bradley, recognized, uh, to his credit, recognized that this conviction was wrong. And he overturned it and pardoned George Denning within a few days of him arriving at the prison. Denning got out of jail. Uh, I, I sh it's also important to, to know that uh, the, the lynch mob came back to his house the next morning, drove his wife and sick children off uh, and set fire to his home and to his barn and to his gear house and burned everything he had worked for to the ground. So when he got out of prison, he had nothing to return to. Uh, his family moved north and met him in Louisville. They eventually moved over to Jeffersonville, Indiana. Uh, Denning became sort of lionized by the black community in Louisville. Um, they recognized that he had shown a level of courage that was remarkable and they sent him on a bit of a speaking circuit to black churches around Louisville and they celebrated him, uh, took up offerings for him, um, uh, you know, helped him out. And in this time he, uh, he met uh, a man named Bennett Young. Bennett Young was a former Civil War hero. Uh, he had fought for the South. He was a true son of the South. He had been born to a family who owned slaves. He never did, but his father did. Um, uh, but he fought uh, with Morgan's Raiders. If anybody knows that story, he eventually um, led the northernmost land action in the Civil War, which few people know about. It was a raid out of uh, Canada into Vermont, down into a town called St. Albans, Vermont. And they held the town hostage. These Confederate soldiers did for about 24 hours. Um, uh, anyways, Young, after the war, became a lawyer, and he took on the case of George Denning, and primarily because he, uh, he saw after the war that what he had been fighting for was, um, was you know, not right. Uh, we know this now. I think they were weighing these matters at that time in the 1890s, but he knew it was not right. And so he sort of dedicated the last half of his life to um, helping people of color when he could, including founding an orphanage for black children uh, and taking on the cases of people who had trouble accessing the court system, folks like George Denning. So he represented George Denning in federal court and they brought a lawsuit against the members of that lynch mob and um, for damages that they had caused. Uh, and they sued the mob um, and at the risk of giving away uh, the, the last part of the book, uh, they won, which was unheard of. It's the first time this had ever happened in American history when a man had sued a lynch mob and actually won damages to the tune of $50,000, which is equivalent to about $1.5 million today. Um, so, that's uh, in essence the story. Uh, you know, you can't tell a seventy thousand word book in five minutes, but um, that gives you a flavor of it. And I am um, I'm super excited to talk about the the nuances of that and the and the rest of it uh, as well. Some of the challenges in terms of researching this thing and um, and and the problems with um, uh, trying to uh, get get your hands on. Um, these kinds of stories that let us better understand how things were for people of color in that era. 
Yeah, you make the point that this is um, sort of a, a strange period in time that was not documented very well and that a lot of people are not aware of many of the, the gains and the stories that happened in those years before we hit that big civil rights movement. So this story that fell between the cracks. And, yeah. and that brings me to Anthony. How did you two connect? And Anthony, I would love to hear what it felt like to you to hear from an author who wanted to tell your family's story. First of all, um, I normally don't answer my phone with unrecognized numbers. So I just, I don't know for what reason, I guess it was fate. I answered the phone and I hear a guy on the other end. He says, is this Anthony Denny? I'm like, okay, somebody's trying to sell me something. So... <laughs> He said, well, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about your grandfather. And I'm like, my grandfather? So he, you know, told me who he was. And I told him I would be more than happy to talk to him about that. Because I've been doing uh, a lot of research myself about the case. And just hearing from some of my family members. Um, you know, it was quite interesting for me. Because I wanted to find out where I came from and you know, my family history and all like that, because a lot of it had been lost. But Ben told me he was going to be in Louisville, um, you know, a week or so later, and I made arrangements to meet him. So I drove down from Indianapolis, and we met at the Jeffersonville Public Library. Well, I love that. That's another thing libraries are, right? We're meeting places. <laughs> right. so, yeah. When we met Miranda, I should say, Anthony had a stack of papers that was about that thick. Wow. All the research that he had done, uh, you know, uh, more stuff than I feel like I even had. Uh, he, he, you know, and maybe Anthony, you, you spent a lot of time because your wife is also on this call, but she lives in Utah. So you spent yeah. a lot of time at the, at the uh, family research center out there, right? Yes, I did. Uh, quite a few. Every time I go out there, I, I, I make it a point to uh, visit the Family Research Center in, in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's been a big help. Um, just very helpful. I'm finding out a lot of information from the genealogy library and yourself as well, along with uh, uh, Mr. Roland Kloss, uh, who sent me information back in 18. I connected with him. He was a big part as well. Uh, yeah. So I was just eager to, you know, find out more information about my family. Yeah. Yeah, round out those details. <laughs> so, Ben, um, can you tell us, in the context of the day, this case, it sounds like from your book, it went viral. It was everywhere. Um, but awful and unfair things happened all the time. So I'm curious, why do you think that people were so fascinated with this case? You're right. Awful and unfair things did happen on a daily basis, uh, especially in the South, especially in the 1890s. There, um, you know, after the Civil War, um, the Klan began to organize uh, not far south of, of where all this happened. Um, you know, the first meeting of the KKK was in Pulaski, Tennessee, which was only about 100 miles due south of uh, Franklin, Kentucky. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, not to suggest that the, the, the white men who uh, started to harass George Denny or showed up to lynch him that night were members of an organized clan, but they were neighbors and they were, um, you know, the papers called them white cappers or regulators. Um, but they, they, they were taken, they were vigilantes. They were taking the law into their own hands, even though they didn't have the right to do that. Um, and so, uh, so anyhow, that kind of violence, that um, sort of white on black violence was widespread at the time. And the reason that this this case got so much attention is because it very rarely worked out where uh, where the, the where the intended victim of the lynch mob stood up for himself and um, used a gun to protect himself and his family. And that's. Um, you know, that was a that was a rare thing. Uh, so, and, you know, I mean, let's not beat around the bush. Anthony is here today because of his great grandfather's courage 
Uh, right. I mean, we're, we're True. That's right. This is what we're talking about. Yes. And what a what a heavy thing that is to think about that the man sitting in front of us right now is here today because his great grandfather decided he wasn't going to come outside and he wasn't going to kowtow to the 25 white men who were standing out out in his yard saying, get your ass out here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why that's why I think people paid so much attention because he defended himself. And this just didn't happen very often uh, in that in that era. So and it's what attracted me to the story to begin with. You know, have you thought about that, Anthony? Have you? <laughs> is that a part of? Um, well, has. Uh, yes, I have quite a bit. <laughs> um, if it wasn't for his bravery and defending his, you know, wife and children, uh, I wouldn't exist. Because at the time, my grandfather, my father's father, was maybe 10 years old when that happened. So if things went another way, I wouldn't exist. We wouldn't exist. Yeah. And yet, Ben, you describe this man who he stood up for his family. He did what he was supposed to do. But when he found out that the person he had shot died, he immediately turned himself in. Like, mm -hmm. right, this this was a man who had faith in the system and did things the right way. Would you be able to speculate on, I mean, it was like watching a horror movie for me. I was like, do not go in there. <laughs> like, this will not end well. But it did. He yeah. got the protection he deserved. And, and as, I, as I bring up in the book, boy, there were so many cases where um, jailers just sort of handed over the keys to uh, the mob that showed up outside um, where, you know, uh, 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 men were kidnapped from from prison. They, you know, had committed some crime and sometimes they had never even committed a crime. It was the crime of being, quote unquote, uppity or. Um, mm -hmm. stepping out of line or something like that and uh you know then being in prison didn't or in jail rather didn't really matter the mob just showed up and barged in and took them out and did what they wanted with them um uh so that he had faith in the system in that way is really something you know i, I every time i explore stories like this i try to put myself in the shoes of the characters um, and consider things, you know, uh, with all the context, consider things from their perspective. And I'm not sure I would have let the system protect me, but he had the, he had, you know, very good fortune. There was a lot of pressure in Kentucky at the time on the governor who was a Republican governor. Um, there was a lot of pressure on him to uh, pass anti-lynching legislation. I think by and large, the, the, the good people in the state of Kentucky were, um, were uh, sick to death of the violence of lynching in the state and wanted the leaders to do everything in their power to make it stop. And so Bill O'Bradley, you know, as soon as he heard about this case, as soon as word got to him that George Denning uh, had, had surrendered and turned himself in, uh, he did everything in his power to protect Denning, including right up at his trial, he dispatched um, uh, some members of the uh, Kentucky Guard to uh, protect him through the through the whole course of the trial. So the system worked in this case. It worked in his favor, uh, part of it. I mean, he got he got convicted, and and I think everyone agreed that that was unjust, that that was a result of uh, racial bias or prejudice there in in Simpson County. But um, but outside of that conviction. I think the system sort of worked worked for this gentleman. In this case, it did. And and I was not familiar with Governor Bradley. So you just mentioned that um, he really worked on anti-lynching legislation. I found it mm -hmm. fascinating that he had this idea to um, hit lynch mobs in their wallet, um, that he was working on legislation to do that, not counting on their morals or ethics. Um, could you briefly tell us a little bit more about Bradley and the what was going on then? Yeah, he was an interesting politician. There, there actually was a wave in the late uh, 1890s. There was a wave of progressive Republican politicians being elected in the South, and it was short-lived, unfortunately. But 
Um, Bradley was among those and um, uh, yeah, and his idea, I mean, he was trying to approach the problem of lynching in a number of different ways, but his main ideas were to um, define uh, sheriffs and jailers, public servants who succumb to the demands of lynch mobs to find them and kick them out of their jobs. So if you were a sheriff at the time, this legislation would have meant if you surrendered to the lynch mob or like offered up the keys or gave them a prisoner, um, then you, you stood to, uh, to lose, to be fined $500 uh, by the state, and which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was in 1890. Uh, and, um, and then beyond that, you could, you could lose your job, never hold public office again, um, there were a number of different things in place that um, that were just meant to discourage some of these uh, uh, elected officials who might otherwise just, you know, bow down to the to the mobs, to their peers, ultimately to the you know to their white peers. And maybe even gives them something to say, like, guys, you know, I can't do that. I'm gonna lose my job. <laughs> right. right. Gives them a little ground against the mob. We'll see how right. you know. <laughs> Yeah. How about um, another complicated character in this story, um, the lawyer, Bennett Young? Can you tell us a little bit more about him? You described him as a helpful white man who did more than most to preserve the lost cause and legacy of the Confederacy, but also as a man with a complicated legacy. Yeah, uh, such an interesting guy. And I told you a little bit about his experience mm -hmm. during the Civil War. How he, you know, his when he was born, his father owned um, owned people. How should we say this? He, his father had slaves. Um, uh, so he, so he would have grown up in, uh, in the, um, uh, in contact with, with indigenous servants, with slaves. Um, he fought hard for the South and after the war, he, uh, did more than any man of his era to promote the idea of the lost cause and this mythology of Southern chivalry. In fact, he wrote um, a number of books, including including this one, which is a thick tome. It's called um, Confederate Wizards of the Saddle. And it is a, simply a book of uh, war stories from the Civil War that he wrote about the chivalry of uh, these these men who are fighting, as we know now, to preserve the institution of slavery. Um, as leader of the Confederate veterans, uh, Bennett Young raised tons of money, um, you know, starting at about 1900 through about through his death in 1919, tons of money to erect statuary uh, to memorialize Confederate soldiers, the leaders of the Confederacy. He was the driving force behind the building of the um, Jefferson Davis Monument, which is the tallest phallic monument outside of Washington, D.C., uh, there in Western Kentucky. You know, how do you balance that with some of the other things that he did, um, like take on the case of George Denning, argue uh, and that was pro bono. He, you know, he didn't stand to make any money, but it was, um, you know, he put his, his whole self into that case. He, he won it because of his passion, essentially. Um, founded, uh, founded an orphanage for black children and supported it financially for uh, um, several decades. Um, how do you balance that guy, you know? And that's sort of part of what I wrestle with in the book, like, um, how are we to remember people like Bennett Young, who, you know, th these are the statues that we're, we're pulling down right now. The, um, you know, the statues in, uh, in, of Lee in New Orleans. He gave the keynote address at the unveiling of the statue of Lee in downtown New Orleans, which came down in 2015 or was relocated. Um, you know, all of this is is front and center, and it's it's actually sort of slipped into the back seat uh, in the in the maybe the last year or so of the Trump presidency. Some other things have taken precedence, but um, you know, it's still very much an issue that we're dealing with. Um, you know, and I make the point in the preface 
like in my mind, uh, the death of George Floyd, which was the last sort of the most recent spark of this, uh, this, this burning fire for justice and, and peace and equality. Um, his death is the most recent casualty in my mind of the civil war. And a lot of people might object to that, might roll their eyes at that, but I feel like the Civil War didn't really end in, 19, in uh, 1865. Uh, we are still, it just devolved. I'm not the first person to say this. Hannah Nicole Jones has written about it a lot, and the folks at the New York Times with their 1619 project have written about this very thing, but it, it didn't end in 1865. It just devolved into skirmishes uh, that are now playing out on the streets of America and on Facebook and in the high school classrooms. And this is what we're, you know, we continue to deal with this. So, um, so in that way, the book, I think, even though it played out a hundred years ago, um, it's still, it still echoes it's present. This is what we're still talking about. Um, so. Yeah. I, I wonder, I actually have never, um, asked Anthony if he can articulate his feelings about Bennett Young, knowing what you know about him. Um, what, do you, what do you think of him and his legacy? Well, quite naturally, I think he's a great guy for taking my great grandfather's case yes. in a time where blacks had very little representation. So he's a stand up guy in my uh, opinion. Yeah. And uh, also raising an orphanage for black children. That says a lot about him. But I couldn't find or know anything about him ever speaking which way or another he leaned as far as blacks. I don't, I don't see that. Uh, yeah. I don't know if he ever talked or spoke to any one of his counterparts about that or how they felt about him during that time, you know, representing a black person and having a black orphanage. I don't know. Yeah. Not sure. And being a Confederate as well, it just didn't mix for me. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like in this case, we can, we can be thankful for the, the service he gave and the contributions he made, but we also recognize that he's the very definition of a flawed character. Right. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we're yeah. certainly grateful for his role in your great grandfather's case. And, yes. And for the good works that endure. Yeah. So that that brings us right around to research. Would you like to talk a little bit, Ben, about the time you spent in archives and cemeteries and learning mm -hmm. about these characters so that you could flesh them out for us as readers? Absolutely. Um, I, I, you know, don't pretend to be a historian. Uh, I th I'm a student of history and I'm a journalist, but um, uh, for me, doing the research is the most fun. Um, it means throwing myself into, uh, into a story to try to learn everything I possibly can about a story because uh, in this book, I don't make any assumptions. Um, and so if I, want to tell a story with vivid detail, vivid enough to create a cinematic picture in the mind's eye of the reader, uh, then I need to know everything there is to possibly know about something. Um, and so, you know, if I write, for instance, in the first part of the book, and I'll just, uh, just read a, a tiny bit of this. Um, you know, when the guns fell silent and the white men took cover, George Denning burst out the back of his little wooden house wearing only his undergarments. He ran through the frigid January air, and when he reached the tall grass of a nearby field, he hurled himself down flat on his back, his lungs heaving, his breath visible and rising beneath the moon almost full and what seemed to be a million stars poking through a smoky blue-black midnight sky. He lay still and quiet and listened to the men's voices coming from the north beyond the house. They sounded at first as though they were in a state of consternation, but the voices grew distant as time slid by, suggesting retreat. When he could no longer hear the voices over the heartbeat in his own ears, he sat up slowly, looked around, then darted across the field toward his house. 
His wife met him at the door with his boots, his heavy coat and his hat. And he dressed quickly without saying much, then turned away from the humble home he had built with his own hands, the only home his children had ever known, the home he had defended. And he disappeared into the darkness. Uh, you know, if I'm going to write a, a, you know, a scene like that, well, it means figuring out um, not just the temperature on the night of January 26, 1897, but also the barometric pressure uh, so that I could say with clarity and, and authority that you, he could see his own breath, for instance. Um, and that is a, that's a tall order, you know? Uh, so it means, it, means, um, it means doing a ton of research. It means reading everything I can possibly get my hands on. In this case, I spent um, about two weeks total at the um, archives at the Simpson County Historical Society there in Franklin, uh, I spent about a week going through the archives at the Filson uh, Club in, uh, in Louisville. Um, spent a couple of days with, with Anthony, um, you know, trying to find, yeah, I mean, part of the unfortunate thing is his grandfather's, his great grandfather's grave is unknown. We don't know where exactly he's buried. There's no, uh, there's no headstone, no, no marker. We know the cemetery in which he's buried because it says so on the death certificate, but the, the record, burial records uh, were lost in a flood in the 1930s. And so, um, and so that grave is, uh, is gone, um, but it means digging as deep as you possibly can, not just into the records, but also connecting with people who might have family legacy, who might have stories about, um, you know, stories that aren't written down. Um, in this case, uh, uh, Anthony's family actually has a story that I, I never found anywhere on the record. And it's a little fuzzy, right, Anthony? But, um, yeah. uh, you know, how Molly Denning and the kids got to Jeffersonville mm -hmm. uh, is sort of unknown. Uh, do you want to tell what your family knows about that? Well, ever since I was a kid, you know, I heard that. One of my grandfathers killed a white man and had to flee. Um, we were always told that my grandmother and the kids um, got to Jeffersonville by way of barrels crossing the Ohio River. And that's the only story that I know of and the only story that I heard. So. Yeah, so we don't know if, if you know, if they were hiding in barrels on a barge or if they were actually like inside of barrels floating across the river. It, it, um, but, it, and that might sound wild, but it was, it wouldn't have been in the 1890s, you know, and that area uh, was in, it, it was the, um, it was one major route for the Underground Railroad uh, mm -hmm. from Louisville across to, um, Jeffersonville and what, what's the neighboring town, Anthony? Just uh, uh, New Albany. New Albany. Yeah, New yeah. Albany played a major part in the Underground Railroad. Yeah, and and there are stories of um, you know uh, of men and women run you know, who have uh, who had escaped uh, slavery showing up on the banks on the south bank of the Ohio River there across from New Albany, and uh, you know a man with on a barge with a lantern sort of steering across, picking them up and bringing them over to what was essentially the north, uh, north of the Mason-Dixon line. So, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it doesn't, it doesn't sound uh, unreasonable to think that Molly Denning and her children would have had to hide in barrels to make it across, across the river. Well, and particularly as they were fleeing from men who had ordered them out of their house, they yeah. were fleeing violence. So it just really hit me in that moment how courageous and brave Molly Denning was as well. Um, as a reminder, I don't know if we, we mentioned this, they had 11 children. Right. And um, most of those children were younger and Molly Denning escorted her children to safety, many of them not wearing shoes. They weren't dressed for the weather. They were not given a chance to go back into the house. So um, many heroes in this story, and for the Dennings, um, a lot of family pride to draw on, for and, sure. 
uh, just to add to that, you know, when George Denning made it to Louisville, um, uh, really around the time that he word started to get out that he had the intention of bringing a lawsuit against the lynch mob. Mm. Uh, you know, we still don't know exactly what happened, but he was attacked uh, in Louisville late one night. And we don't know by whom, but a group of people um, busted his head open with a brick and gouged out one of his eyes. Uh, and I believe left him for dead. And he didn't die, he recovered. Uh, I, I found the hospital records where he checked into the hospital and it lists his injuries and uh, the treatment that he received. Um, but, uh, you know, could that have been the, the same men who tried to kill him in um, Simpson County, uh, several hundred miles south? Could have been. They were, you know, they got, they secured their lawyer from Louisville so uh, it wasn't it wasn't super rare that they would hop on a train and come up to Louisville. Um, the timing is suspicious. They, you know, the newspapers had started to report that George Denning, this guy who had defended himself and killed a white man, um, was going to bring a lawsuit against the lynch mob. And shortly after word got out, uh, he's attacked and left for dead one night in the street. So, you know, violence for, for the Denning family was ever present and always you know, nipping, nipping at their heels. It's just an amazing story. It's an amazing family story. It's an amazing story from, from our country's history. And so as, as a journalist and an author, could you speak to why it is important that we, we read these kinds of stories, that we talk about them, that we revisit that time in our past? I think that, um, you know, we tend to uh, think of this civil rights movement uh, as starting in maybe the 1950s, early 1960s. Um, we're coming up on Black History Month, in February, and we rightly celebrate uh, people like Martin Luther King and um, Rosa Parks and, you know, John Lewis. Um, that, that is valuable. Um, those leaders stood on the shoulders of men and women who have been forgotten by history. Uh, the period, you know, from like 1950 to 1865, um, the, 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 there is a dearth of black history. And it's because uh, we, we, the white people alive at the time were not taking note. When black people showed up in the newspaper, by and large, unless it was George Washington Carver or someone like that, uh, by and large, if, if there was a black name in the newspaper, it was either somebody who was being ridiculed publicly or because the person had been lynched. And um, I challenge you to look through papers of that era because there are very few departures from what I just said. Um, and so, so why do we remember these things? Why do we bring them back up? Because uh, it is that time, because we have, the, we have the burden right now of trying to figure out why we are the way we are as a society. And that, uh, that burden asks us to look back upon these stories and to do the hard work it takes to bring them to the surface and to tell them again in engaging and compelling ways um, so that we can have this conversation, you know, because it's not a simple conversation. And when we demand that Confederate statuary be pulled down, that's, that's one thing, it's one voice. Um, uh, when we say, no, don't remove any Confederate statuary, um, that is another position, uh, and it's not simple. It's somewhere in, in the mix of that. Um, it's somewhere on that prism. Uh, and so these stories, I think, help us better understand who our ancestors were, black and white, um, and they give us the foundation upon which we can start to talk about how to be better people. 
that's a high bar. We all want to be better people every day, right? So it, that's the high bar we're aiming for. Uh, well, at uh, 7.43 here, I want to open this up for questions. Um, for anyone who's in the event, you may have been holding on to some questions. We can watch the chat for that, or if you're watching us through Facebook Live, um, please leave us a comment on there. We're watching that as well. Or if you'd like to just chime in and ask with your voice, you're welcome to do that. Oh, I see one in the chat already. So here's our, our first question. See a congratulations on the book, wonderful and detailed. Um, George and Molly only got a fraction of the verdict. They lost their farm, and today the black were population the black population of Simpson County is just a fraction of what it was in 1897. While the story of George Denning is important and mm -hmm. remarkable, can Anthony comment on whether George and his descendants truly received justice? No. That's, that's a tough question. I mean, for me. No, no, me, no. For me, no. Um, he was burnt and forced to leave a farm that he had farmed for 14 years. I believe it was somewhere 120, 125 acres. Um, yep. So, no. On one end, he did sue. And he did win, but you have to read the book to get the rest of the story. I don't want to give that up, like Ben said. Um, yes. He lost a lot. There, the whole family lost a lot, and and then remember Everything. too that that Everything. was generations were already there. Is that right, Anthony? At the time that this happened, I know at least Molly's mother lived close by. So they were mm -hmm. driven away from their family and their connections as well. Yes, they were. Um, I believe my grandfather, my great grandfather's mother, Mary, ended up in Jeffersonville for a time before her death. Um, that's about all I know about that. But they literally lost everything they had. Everything. everything. Oh, I see uh, Nikki has a question. Nicola Babcock. Hi, Miranda. Hello. Hey, Ben, congratulations. Hi, Nicola. It's so nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, thank you for having, spending your time here with us tonight and to the Denning family, obviously, too. Uh, my question is, um, we, before we went into questions, you mentioned it's important to have these conversations. My, I'm curious, when you were doing your research, were you able to, or did you um, attempt to um, get in contact with relatives of the members of the of the mob? I sure did, and I feel like I I met a few of them, but um, uh, nobody was ready to admit that they were, you know, family with with the mob. No, I, I spent a lot of time in Simpson County and met people with the same last name as uh, the, the, the guys who showed up outside George Denning's house. Um, uh, at some point, you sort of realize that it, um, it may be fruitless, you know, uh, the family that inherited this trauma was the Denning family. Um, those other families just sort of continued on, right? And uh, so in the limited amount of time that I had to do this book, I thought it, I thought it was best to spend uh, what time I could trying to get in touch with people like Anthony. And by the way, I just clicked through and I saw um, that the man who uh, sort of did the first uh, work on this story, Roland Close, Klaus, is, uh, is on the line. I just want to acknowledge. I just want to acknowledge um, uh, that uh, you know one of the early things I saw was a was a blog post uh, by him and some early research that he had done, and uh, it's research that I'm thankful for because it um, did a good job of teasing me toward uh, <laughs> understand better understanding you know what was at stake here and what the story was. So, if you're listening, sir, thank you for. Um, Thank you for being on and thank you for doing that hard work. Thank you. 
that segues perfectly into a question that was on our uh, Facebook Live here. Oh, yes. Uh, Marjorie asks how you first got interested in this story, Ben, and it sounds like you came across this on a blog where somebody had already gotten that started. Uh, not exactly. Um, I was, I had done a, uh, I was engaged in a long project for the Tampa Bay Times on police shootings in the state of Florida, trying to account for about six years worth of police shootings. And we were very close to starting to understand that 40% of people shot by police in the state of Florida are black and, um, and which is way out of whack with the black population, which hovers around 15%. Um, so, and more often than not, these police, the shooting reports that I was reading were tragic. And I connected with a group of uh, black mothers that, um, you, you know, mothers who had lost sons, sometimes teenage <laughs> sons to police violence. Uh, and I felt myself being just, I mean, the, the weight of the burden of that work was crushing. And I mm -hmm. started, uh, because I do book, book work on the side, I started to wonder if there was any, um, if there were any stories where that didn't end so tragically. Um, and so I was in active pursuit of that kind of story because it felt like not, like if I was feeling this, and that project started, by the way, after the shooting of Michael Brown in St. Louis, if, mm -hmm. or in Ferguson, Missouri, if I was feeling this, other people were probably feeling it too. And I try to stay attuned to my own emotion. And um, if I felt this desire to have a, a story told in a big way that, uh, that didn't end so tragically, then maybe there were other people out there who were feeling that as well. And so I started to actively look for, you know, for a story that, um, that had a, an ending where the person of color got retribution or got revenge. Um, and, uh, and so that's, so I found it on newspapers.com, which is a really great searchable historic newspaper archive. Um, after reading a couple of stories there, then I, I, you know, popped over to Google and found and very quickly found Mr. Close, Klaus's um, uh, a blog post. And uh, I think it was the words of uh, Bennett Young and a story that he posted um, that gave me the indication that there might be something seriously important to tell here. Uh, Young had this special way of speaking and one of the newspapers, I think in St. Louis had reprinted pretty much his whole closing argument. And, um, you know, and it was this, uh, is this sort of glorified um, uh, uh, speech that, uh, that sold me on, you know, doing, doing the work to, doing further work, I guess, to try to figure out if there was, if there was a deeper story there to tell. And then everything I found, everything I turned up suggested that, you know, it had the, the records there to support it. You, you can't do a book if you don't have records. And thank goodness the state of Kentucky preserved um, a folder basically that, that uh, is still in the archives in um, Lexington that, uh, that has the entire transcript of, this, of the criminal case against George Denning. And so one of my friends who may be on this call as well uh, Jennifer P. Brown, who lives in Hopkinsville, she bounced over to um, the state archives and, and took a photograph of every page of that court transcript and sent it to me. And I read it and I was just, it was this rush of, you know, it was like drama. I thought all I have to do is reprint this court transcript and this will sell the book, you know, because it's so dramatic. I mean, George Denning's 12 year old daughter testifies about the bullets flying through her hair, um, uh -huh. just full of, full of drama. So, um, so that sealed the deal for me. That was exciting to read. I gotta say, and, yeah. and it also, so for, for those of you that haven't read the book yet, when you get to it, I was pretty floored by how the, uh, the attorneys treated the witnesses. Oh, mm -hmm. I mean, there was no, like, that's a leading question, you know, 
Right. That was all leading questions. So when you right. check out the book, you will see styles have changed in the courtroom. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At some, I'm I'm listening to the audio and uh, this is for the first time because they they hired a voice actor to read the thing and so I'm listening to the audio audio and throughout the whole court case. I'm driving around in my car with the audio playing and I'm like, objection, you know, like <laughs> I find myself like wanting to yes. object. Yeah. Me too. Uh, I see that we have um, Jens in the chat. Jens would like to ask a question. Yes, thank you. Um, oh, it's Yen. Hi, Ben. Oh, hi, Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. Yen. Yen. Well, that's fine. It's a common, um, <laughs> um, that's fine. Um, I just finished your book yesterday and congratulations and wonderful. And one of the questions I was, and it's such an important book at this moment, I think, and thank yeah. you for it. Sure. One of the questions I was left at, at with the end and, and, and this, you know, I, I think um, uh, George Dinning's um, great grand, um, Son is is absolutely correct. Justice was not done, although maybe there was more justice done than was common at the time. But here's one question I was left with: Did did the Denning Denning family ever was were they ever able to reclaim their land? No, we were not. <laughs> That's, That's what not I was good. expecting, but but. Um, you guys want to talk about that? That's my Joyce. Um, yeah. She can, she can tell you. <laughs> no, we were not. We were never compensated for anything. We, he never got anything from it. Yeah, that's what I was. So uh, it was just like a mute point. Why sue if you can't collect? Right. If you try to collect, the mob will get you again. So leave it alone. Yeah, yeah there was a, um, a, either in the New Yorker or maybe New York Review of Books some time ago, there was a long story about how in the history of this country, uh, the white people have figured out ways, legal and semi-legal, to deny claims to, to land that black people owned after the civil war and and basically yeah. stripped them of it and this seems to be sort of at least partially um in that hopper well and if you're if you're engaged at all in uh the you know quiet conversations about reparations um yeah. then you, you you know this um unfortunately we have had you know other more terrible things to worry about for the last four years, but perhaps there is an opening uh, with, a, with a new president to re-engage in that conversation that's been going on for a long time about um, how to make amends for, uh, you know, for past injustice like this, like this very real case that didn't play out all that long ago. Uh, and this very real family that sits before you that um, inherited the trauma of, uh, 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 you know, an attempted lynching. Uh, this was not an uncommon thing. And I think we all uh, stand to gain from engaging in that conversation, re-engaging that conversation. Um, and I don't know what shape it takes, and but but I know that um, you know it is high time that uh, that you know we we start to talk once more about achieving some level of justice for people who are wronged in this very way. Wow. And if that isn't a great answer to the reason of why we should be reading these stories and sharing these stories with each other, because one human to another it 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 puts it in perspective yeah, yeah. i okay. see that uh roderick denning had his hand raised um roderick <laughs> did you have a, a question or a comment to share 
No, I just wanted to uh, tell my brother we love him and and Ben, we love you also. And thank y'all so much. This means a lot to us. You know, this is great. Anthony did a wonderful job. And that's about all. It's just really moving and touching for me right now. No. Oh. Thank you and so much. I appreciate, I appreciate <laughs> it. There is a message from Lisa in the, the chat also, Anthony's sister, and said, um, Ben, you did a remarkable job with this. And uh, God bless you that we needed this story for our history. So I'm going to choke up over here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I need to acknowledge that, um, you know, I in some ways felt a bit like an interloper. Uh, I don't, I, just to address the, you know, the you did elephant. Say that. Yeah. The elephant. Um, I am a white guy, right? And uh, when I first started thinking about trying to tell this story, I wondered, I wrestled with the situation of like, do I have the cultural right to tell a story like this? Uh, and I talked to people about it. I talked to my agent about it. And to be frank, she was a little discouraging at first when I first brought it up. Um, you know, you, you're aware of the controversy if, you, if you're in the literary world with uh, American Dirt, the novel that came out a couple of years ago. Um, yes. Uh, not, not to suggest that this is close to that, but, um, you know, I would not have... I did a lot of work on this before I met Anthony, but I would had I would not have pursued it beyond that had Anthony shown any kind of uh, resistance toward me telling this story. And so, in many ways, his welcoming nature and his um, uh, you know his invitation to um, to share was uh, the permission that I needed to you know to bring this this book to life. And so I, you know, I'm in debt to you and your family in ways that you don't know. Um, Cause the last thing I want to do is be that you, I met after hurricane Katrina, when I was a reporter at the uh, Tampa Tribune, I learned that the, this um, girl band that came about in the 1960s, I think called the Dixie cups, they had relocated from the ninth ward in new Orleans to a, a hotel on bears Avenue in Tampa, Florida. And I went and met them there and I said, you know, so where's, you know, basically where's, where's your money? Like what, how are, how are y'all living in this holiday inn? And they said, you know, we never really made any money. And these, this is the, the people who made famous that song, go into the chapel and oh, we're yeah. going to get married. Yeah. <laughs> Dixie cups. They never profited off any of that because they had a white manager. The guy who made them famous took all their money. And mm -hmm. so they were, you know, into their 60s and they were still doing weddings and birthdays and stuff like that. And um, I don't I don't mean to draw a parallel here, but I, I didn't I don't want to. I'm not the guy. I'm not that guy. <laughs> I'm not that manager, you know, that like money hungry. Uh, fella who's here to profit off this story i think um you know uh as anthony knows we we talk transparently about um about this situation and uh you know and how we can work together to um get the get the story out there and if yeah. some serious financial success comes out of it then you know we'll have the conversation about uh how to divvy that up Sounds right to me. Yeah. So everybody who's who's a part of this event, remember, check that chat log or Matt could probably share that again. If you want to buy a copy of this book and get you a signed book plate, our uh, local indie, The Raven, has set that up for us. Of course, you can also borrow from the library, available in many formats. Um, as, as we close up this evening, I just want to say thank you again to Ben for writing this great book and to the Denning family for joining us for this conversation tonight. Um, it just, I see someone in the, in the comments said, you know, hearing from the family, you know, that really warms my heart. And for me too, I already thought this was a fantastic book, but this really, um, made it real in a way that we don't always get 
to experience. So I'm so thankful that you all were able to join us to celebrate this book launch. And And I have to, oh, go ahead, Ben. If, if, if you're on this call and your last name uh, starts with a D and ends with a G uh, and you don't have a copy of the book, tell, tell Anthony to send me a text with your address and I will put one in the mail tomorrow. Uh, I'm waiting on mine already. Oh, very good. Let me awesome. make, sure I get your, make sure I get your address because I got a, I got a box. I need one too. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna see some of the family sharing this thing around. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, Ben. We just, uh, as a family, we want, we want to thank you once again for uh, getting the story out there because it was a story that needed to be told. Needed to be told. We're Everyone deeply indebted, that, and we really appreciate that. And I believe my grandfather's spirit chose you to write that for a reason. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's a really beautiful way to um, to tie a bow on this tonight. Really, it is. It's just that that family and human face. I'm sorry, I'm getting all. Um, I, I have to put in a plug for our library's genealogy. Um, we have yeah. a fantastic genealogy librarian, Sherry Camp, who has a lot of experience, um, particularly with African American genealogy and the many roadblocks that come up when you're trying to discover your family story that has been erased. Um, so please uh, get in touch with us at the library, 580-4400, email me, and we can get you more information if you're interested in finding your own family story. And with that, I just want to thank you all again. Thank you all for attending and being part of this conversation. Thank you most to Ben and to the Denning family. And we look forward to seeing you for the next one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.